Have you ever wondered how the concept of the Godhead developed in the Bible? Our journey begins with the Book of Romans. Chapter 1 verse 20, for instance, draws our attention to the invisible aspects of God which are understood through His creations. This verse emphasizes the eternal power of the Godhead, making it clear that there are no excuses for not recognizing it. Let's hop over to Genesis now, where the notion of the Godhead takes on a more tangible form. In the first chapter, verses 26 and 27, God declares, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. This phrase is echoed again in Genesis 5, verses 1 and 2, where it's recorded that God created man and woman in his likeness, blessing them and naming them both Adam. These passages are not mere poetic language, but rather a reflection of the divine design. They underscore the belief that human beings were created not only in the character of God, but also in form and feature. So, what does God look like? The Bible provides us with some clues. It mentions God's feet and hands in Exodus 24 verses 10 and 11. We learn about his mouth in Numbers 12 verse 8 and even his hair in Daniel 7 verse 9. These anthropomorphic descriptions serve to make the divine more relatable, to bridge the gap between the human and the divine. But remember, God's image is not confined to physical characteristics. The Bible also uses metaphors and symbolism to express the deeper truths about the Godhead. For instance, earthly cities are named for significant divine figures, adding another layer to our understanding of the divine. As we delve deeper into the scriptures, we discover that the Bible presents an image of God that is both transcendent and relatable, a Godhead that is complex and yet deeply personal. The Godhead is not a distant, abstract concept, but a divine reality that intimately involves itself in creation and in our lives. The journey to understanding the Godhead is a journey into the heart of God himself. So let's keep exploring and let's keep asking questions. After all, the language of the Bible is to be explained according to its obvious meaning. Did you know that city names in the Bible often have deeper meanings connected to the Godhead? This might come as a surprise to many of us who are accustomed to thinking of places like Jerusalem and Israel purely in geographical terms. But let's take a closer look, shall we? Galatians 4.26 says, But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Now this isn't talking about the physical city of Jerusalem that we can locate on a map. Instead, this verse is using the name Jerusalem to represent an aspect of the Godhead. Similarly, when we see the name Israel in the Bible, it's not always referring to a nation or a group of people. It's a common misconception. And it's understandable. After all, when we read about cities or nations in any other context, we naturally think about the geographical locations and the people who live there. But the Bible often employs these names metaphorically to convey profound spiritual truths. Consider this. The Lord can't marry a nation or a city, right? The Lord can establish a covenant, a sacred agreement with a group of people, but a marriage is something different. A marriage is between one man and one woman, and that's it. In this context, the names Jerusalem and Israel take on a whole new significance. They represent aspects of the divine elements of the Godhead that we are in relationship with. So, when we read these city names in the Bible, let's remember to look beyond the geographical. Let's delve deeper into the spiritual meanings that these names hold and what they reveal about the Godhead. This understanding can enrich our reading of the Bible and enhance our relationship with God. In the biblical context, city names often reveal deeper truths about God and our relationship with Him. So the next time you come across a city name in the Bible, take a moment to ponder. What hidden truths might it be trying to reveal? Have you ever thought of the Godhead as a family? It's an idea that might seem foreign at first, but it's deeply rooted in biblical scripture. Let's delve into it, shall we? Consider John 3.16, a verse we all know well. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Here we see God as a Father and Jesus as his begotten Son. This isn't just a metaphor, it's a relationship, a familial bond that exists within the Godhead. Then there's Ephesians 3.15, which says, Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. This verse talks about a family, a family in heaven and on earth. It's not just about us, the human family, it's about the divine family as well. The Father, the Son, 
And yes, there's more to the family. This brings us to the Heavenly Mother. Now, this might be a new concept for some. The idea of a Heavenly Mother isn't explicitly mentioned in the scriptures as such. Yet if we look closely, we can find traces of her presence. Let's turn to Isaiah 28, 10. It says, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. This verse encourages us to piece together information from different parts of the scripture. It's like a puzzle, and when we put the pieces together, a picture of the Heavenly Mother emerges. She's there, in the relationship between God and His people, in the love that Christ shows for the Church, and in the nurturing nature of the Holy Spirit. So we have a father, a son, and a mother, a divine family. Each member of this family plays a unique role, yet they are all united in their love for us, their created children. The Bible paints a picture of the Godhead as a loving family, inviting us into a relationship with them. Could there be a daughter in the Godhead? Let's explore this intriguing idea. The Hebrew Scriptures hold many mysteries, and one such enigma is the presence of a female entity in the Godhead. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 37, verses 22 and 23, we find a vivid depiction of the daughter of Jerusalem shaking her head in reproach. This act of defiance, this speaking out against blasphemy, is not just a historical event. It signifies the presence of a divine feminine figure, one that defends the sanctity of the divine. This idea is echoed in the Song of Solomon. This book, often considered the most misunderstood in the Bible, presents what appears to be a divine love story. The wise king Solomon professes his love for his sister, his undefiled, the use of the word undefiled suggests a purity, a holiness that is beyond human. This hints at a divine feminine entity, a sister, a spouse, a part of the Godhead. But who is this divine entity? The book of Proverbs gives us a clue. Chapter 8 verses 23 and 24 introduces us to wisdom, personified as a female. She declares, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. Wisdom, then, is not just a concept or a virtue, but a divine figure. She is eternal, existing before the earth itself. And she is not alone, but grows up with Christ. As stated in Proverbs 8.30, I was by him as one brought up with him. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. These verses paint a picture of a divine daughter, one who is wise, pure, and eternally present. She is a part of the Godhead, yet often overlooked in our understanding of the divine. While often overlooked, the Bible gives us glimpses of a divine daughter, adding another layer of complexity to our understanding of the Godhead. So, what have we learned about the Godhead from these biblical references? We've taken a fresh look at some familiar passages and seen them in a new light. We've explored the idea that the Godhead, as depicted in the Bible, goes beyond a traditional father and son dynamic. We've seen how the scriptures suggest a Godhead that resembles a family, including a heavenly father, mother and son. This concept has been reinforced through the analysis of city names within the Bible. We've seen how the names of cities like Jerusalem and Israel can represent divine individuals, not just geographical locations. By understanding the context of these names, we've gained a deeper insight into the nature of the Godhead. The notion of God as a family has been further emphasized through the interpretation of verses like Ephesians 3.15, which speaks of a whole family in heaven and earth. This familial depiction of the Godhead suggests a divine unity and relationship that goes beyond our earthly understanding. We've also delved into the controversial and often misunderstood idea of a divine daughter within the Godhead. We've looked at passages from Isaiah, Kings and the Song of Solomon, teasing out the references to a daughter of Jerusalem and an undefiled dove. Though this concept might challenge traditional views, it offers a fresh perspective on the Godhead and its potential dimensions. Importantly, we've also considered how the Bible's language should be understood in its obvious meaning, as stated in Romans 1.20. The visible world reflects the invisible Godhead, emphasizing the importance of interpreting Scripture with an open mind and heart. The Bible presents a rich, multifaceted view of the Godhead. As we continue to study and reflect, we may find that our understanding of God continues to grow and evolve. 
As we delve further into this topic in future discussions, let's remember to approach the scriptures with curiosity, humility, and a willingness to see the divine in new, unexpected ways.